Our next caller is Ashley from Ohio. What's up, Ashley? How can we help you? Hi, guys. I did just want to say thank you for thank you to all of you for taking the time out of your day to do things like this. It's extremely valuable um, to people like myself. Thank so you. I do have two questions unrelated. One is about fitness and one about nutrition. So hoping we can get to both. The first one, though, is about nutrition. So I've read quite a few books regarding carbohydrates and sugars and long-term how they affect us with chronic diseases and even in the short term, how they affect our body's uh, processing of fats and the protein that we eat. So just per my understanding, when we eat carbs or sugars, of course, our, our body releases insulin to regulate the glucose in our blood. But that also, that insulin also stops the fat from being able to freely move in and out of our fat cells. Basically, it locks up our fat, and that's what eventually causes weight gain. So I do track my macros. My priority is always protein. Um, I'm always at 125 grams a day or more. And I do stick to a very low-carbohydrate diet, not quite keto, but I try to stay under 100 grams a day. Um, sometimes it's more like 50 or 60 grams a day. And I feel fine with that. But I, I just, I don't understand, I guess, based on all the information that I've read, the things that I've learned, I, I don't understand where carbohydrates should really fit into a healthy diet. And then that kind of leads me to, obviously, it's hard to cut out all carbs, but fruit I know is good. So just trying to get your guys' opinion on carbohydrates and where they do fit in a healthy my, diet. Uh, my opinion is this is why the fitness industry sucks yeah. because we do this. We we overcomplicate something that is much simpler uh, than what we're making it and we try and scare people into a, a way of thinking or eating to sell my books or to sell my program or to sell my diet. And it's unfortunate because you can tell you're you're very smart. I can tell that you understand that, but yet you're asking a very good question based off of probably conflicting stuff that you hear around carbohydrates yeah. and insulin. It's like- They're not, car carbs are not, are not bad. No. Um, if you look at the issues with carbohydrate intake, what you're seeing is the result of excess calories. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm oversimplifying. Of course, there's healthier versus less healthy foods. This is true for fats and proteins as well as, as carbohydrates. But generally speaking, if you look at like the obesity epidemic and they've done this, right? They'll be like, oh, it's because we're consuming more fat. That's what happened in the eighties and nineties. Like, oh no, no, it's actually carbs. No, what it is is reading more of everything. <laughs> Our calories have gone up significantly. Really what, what correlates strongest to the obesity epidemic and inflammation and disease is heavily processed foods. And heavily processed foods are just engineered to make us eat, eat yeah. more. So the more of our diets that are made up of heavily processed foods, the more calories we eat. And then that becomes the issue. Sugar, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats don't have lots of negative effects when the calories are appropriate. When the calories are high, Sugars become a problem. Certain fats become a problem. Even too many proteins can become a problem when the calories are are too high. So that's generally what's happening. Okay. Now, to take it a step further, if you look at the studies on longevity, you'll find societies where their diets are predominantly or, or a majority of their calories come from carbohydrates and they live a very long time. So this is just, it's just not true. Now, are carbs essential? No, they're not essential. But that doesn't mean that they that eating them is isn't better or going to make you feel better. Some people feel better on lower carbs, or the people feel better on higher carbohydrates. This is where individualism or individual you know uh, you know body physiology kind of plays a role, or even psychology. Some people enjoy them more than others. But no, that's not the issue. Now, a lot of times people cut carbs and they feel a lot better, and they're like, "Wow, this is great. What's going on?" Heavily processed foods tend to be carb heavy. Mm -hmm. So what tends to happen when people cut carbohydrates is they tend to eliminate a lot of the heavily processed foods. Like try to think of heavily processed foods in boxes and wrappers that are fat or protein dominant, right? For protein dominant, what are you going to get jerky? Like that's, that's, that's a, it's a processed food, but it's, it's hot the dogs. least, yeah, it's not, or hot dogs, I guess, probably not great either, yeah. but most heavily processed foods are kind of carb heavy. So it's a result of, of that. So I wouldn't worry about carbohydrates. Gary Tobbs is he 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 definitely can be an alarmist with yeah. certain things. Yes, insulin does what you said, but that's not the full story. Yeah, it's not that simple. No, if you're if your calories are lower than what you're burning, 
and you're eating, you know, 65% of your calories from carbohydrates, you're going to still lose body fat. Like that's I mean, the way you it definitely works. want to pay attention to your behaviors. Like what, uh, if that promotes, if, if like sugars or processed foods, like you incorporate that into your diet, if it promotes, you know, the next day you're, you tend to have, uh, you know, a higher calorie day again, like a lot of times this kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's a snowball effect. It's something that you can, you know, pay attention to remove and it'll affect your behaviors around eating. But in terms of the overall detrimental effects, it's, it's when you're in a high calorie state. That, that's just, and that's the most important thing is yeah. you, you knowing yourself and your own behaviors. Now, if you have this tendency to overconsume when you eat carbohydrates, then you might be a client that I'm going to push you more towards a higher fat, yeah. lower carbohydrate diet for the behavioral reasons, not for the insulin purpose. Like that's yeah, not, exactly. I'm not, that's not what I'm thinking about when I tell my client like, Hey, let's cut back on your yeah, car. Unless you're recommended uh, by a, a medical doctor right. because you have you know, right. some kind of blood sugar issues or uh -huh. insulin resistance, in which case, you know, that might be the case. But if you're otherwise healthy, uh, it, no, it doesn't do that. And again, what they're doing is they're looking at what they're doing is they're looking at carbohydrate intake and obesity and inflammation. And yes, when people eat high carbs, you see more inflammation, you see more obesity, but that's because they're also eating a lot more calories, right? It's not the, the carbs, it's the excess calories. Cause you can make the same connection with fat when you do something like that, which is again, what caused all the, you know, the, the false information in the eighties, uh, and the nineties. So it's, it's, it's the complexity of diet is about individual, how the individual responds, how they feel, but the simplicity, generally speaking, really has more to do with calories. Are you getting essential nutrients? Um, and uh, are you overeating or undereating? Really? That's really what it boils down to. Okay. And that was sort of, I guess, you know, his books definitely make me feel like, um, all carbohydrates are just the devil and you should shouldn't eat them, which is why, you know, I've, I've come to you guys asking because I have cut out, you know, the, the very heavily refined carbohydrates, the processed sugars, because they, they aren't satisfying to me. And it does have, for me, it gives me a, a tendency to eat more of them than yeah. that I would eat mm -hmm. of protein or a fat source. Um, and those are easy to cut out and I, it honestly makes me feel better, but good. it was mainly more like when it comes to your vegetables and your fruits, the things that I enjoy that I know are still good for you. Um, just wanted a little, I guess, reassurance that if those are things that fit into my um, calorie and macro count for the day, that those are, are <laughs> they're not going to throw me way off track. Good, good. And then you had a, did you have a fitness question as well, you said? Yeah. So it actually just any fitness program, but I've been really looking at your guys' programs. Um, I race motocross, ride my dirt bike quite a bit. All right. Um, obviously for training. Cool. So Whenever I, and I've been working out consistently for about three years, um, whenever I have a program, I never know, or I'm looking at a program, I never know how to fit it around my racing and riding schedule. So my goals are obviously strength, um, endurance, and I do have aesthetic goals, goals as well. Um, it feels good to look great. So with, with Moto, you don't want to ever bulk up your mu muscles because it ends up, um, affecting you negatively on the bike. Yeah. So I try to be, you know, lean muscle mass, which is great. But when it comes to my workouts, I usually try to take a rest day before do more of like an active recovery, like, um, walking or a stationary cycle, something that keeps the body moving, but less, um, impact or less, uh, resistance on the muscles and same for the day after I just need a day to recover. So with, uh, like I've been looking at your sexy athlete bundle, with something like that, how would I work that around my own schedule and my priorities with riding or just I, with any sport in general? I actually wouldn't recommend that for you. I would actually recommend MAPS performance based off of the things you're into, like motocross and the fact that you're already smart enough to be doing like these active recovery days leading up. And I would do mobility days. And I would only train one to two days a week of the foundational days from performance and then the mobility days. Yeah. Uh, so the performance is structured where you have three full body workouts a week. Okay. Um, but I, depending on how much motocross riding you're doing would depend on whether I do that one time a week, two times a week, or three times a week. How many days a week are you doing motocross? I mean, during the week, one at most, and that's usually on a Wednesday or Thursday, we have to wait for a track to be open. On the weekends, I try to ride both Saturday and Sunday, and one of those days is usually like a, a race day or performance one, day. One, one day a week of strength training. Yep, That's all I would do. I, I, I've trained a couple motocross uh, riders, 
very demanding. A lot of people don't realize just how demanding that is. Absolutely. Yeah. One day a week of strength training. And yeah. I would pick a MAPS performance uh, foundational workout. That's it. No more strength training. It's going to be too much to add to what you're doing. And it'll, it'll be enough to get you strong, keep you fit, give you what you're looking for to help you know improve your performance with motocross. More than that will probably be too much. Mobility, you can do as much as you want. Though. That's right. The mobility you do on all the other days that you you can work out. So in, so you only have one day of really focused on strength training and then the rest of the days that you can make it to the gym and it's feasible or even yeah. to your living room for that matter, uh, follow the mobility days and literally follow the mobility days to the T, like basically following the program. The only difference on how we would modify the program is like Sal saying, instead of doing three foundational days a week, you would just do one a week. Now, because you're doing, you said Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday for motocross? Yeah, and obviously the weather affects it. If it's raining and we can't ride, I might only get to ride on the weekend or something okay. like that. But yes, generally. The, the day that I would do the strength training would probably be Thursday. So I know you want to have a day before and after, but that's kind of impossible to do with Wednesday and then Saturday and Sunday. I would go Thursday and then uh, you know Monday, Tuesday, mobility, because you're coming off two days of motocross. Uh, Friday mobility and then Saturday, Sunday, you do your motocross. So Thursday would be the day I would do the strength training. Um, and again, pick that workout for mass performance. Okay. And then let's say, you know, like I mentioned, it rains and I don't get to ride during the week. Is it okay to do two days yes. of yep. the? Yep. Yep. And that's how I would decide that is based off exactly that is if this is a week where you didn't ride as much, go ahead and do another foundational. Totally. Day. And you know, again, listen to your body, right? So you, you will have, uh, you will know better than even we know. We're kind of guessing that will be good for you. But if uh, you go to two and you actually still feel really sore in your riding or you feel like it's hindering your workout, mm -hmm. then back off to one. If you're doing one and you're feeling great and you want to try two and you still feel great doing two, then go two. Okay. I'm just, I'm a very small female and I ride a full size dirt bike and I have noticed Im immensely how much of a difference it's made with my riding, just being strong and yeah. oh, having yeah. the endurance I have. So I'm, I'm just ready to, to keep that up and I guess sort of take it to the next level. So Excellent. definitely appreciate your guys' thoughts there. Excellent. Thanks for calling cool. in, Ashley. We'll send you mass performance. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. You guys have a great day. You, you too. too. Have a good one. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you what, if you, if you do a general study and you look at sodium, so salt intake, sugar intake, and fat intake, you will correlate all of those to obesity, inflammation, and disease. Why? Salt, sugar, and fat are the key components of palatable, hyper-palatable food. Right. So it'll also show, which you have to control for, and this is the problem with studies, is they, they don't know what to control for then they don't know what to control for. But what you would do with that is if you saw salt, sugar, and fat is you'd say, oh, they must be eating a lot of heavily processed foods, which means they're probably also eating a lot of calories. And that's why, for example, sodium has gotten connected to poor health in mm -hmm. the past. Now we know with lots of controls, it's not that way, right? So, um, and you see now, you know, and it's really easy, by the way, to sell books and to, yeah. you know, to, to cause a, a- Lots of alarmists out there. Yeah, and be like, oh, it's this, cut this out. And sometimes it's true, usually it's not though. And carbohydrates, we've been consuming, like humans have been consuming carbohydrates, fats, and proteins for thousands of years. And there's cultures where people live a long time and they eat a lot of carbohydrates, and but their calories aren't very high and they're still active. And that's the yeah. key. I mean, generally speaking, I usually try to, uh, just because it's, it's, it, it's something I've noticed with all my clients, like they shared it in common whenever they would uh, get in a rhythm of, of incorporating dessert or like yeah. something that has like a lot of sugar in it, it. It, the, what followed that was more calories would just introduce themselves into the daily routine. Totally. And so it's, you just got to pay attention to these patterns of behavior. And if that's one of your foods or if it's like salt and it's always chips and it's something yeah. that you're con constantly consuming and just adding, you know, mindless calories and you're not getting a lot of nutrients from this type of food, it's something to evaluate. This is why I actually don't like to put a lot of parameters around carbohydrates and fats for clients. Like I, I like to go figure out what my client needs calorie wise, yep. hit, figure get, out their protein intake. Yeah. Get your essential fats. Yes. And, your protein. And, and then as long as the only parameter I have around fat is making sure you get a, a minimal amount of fat, right? So right. making sure you're not below what's healthy. 
And then I let you kind of yeah, go more back. Fat, more yeah, carbs. And, and I, mm-hmm. and I actually encourage the client like, Hey, how about this week? We, we focus on a, a lot or a lot higher fat intake and lower carbon tr- take, keeping calories all the same, just manipulating those two macros. And then next week, let's do the reverse of that. Totally. And then assessing, how did you feel? How did you like it? Was mm-hmm. it easy to follow? Yep. Was it easy to make the meals? And then I'm taking that information and based off of their feedback and what they're what they're telling me, that's how I'm going to manipulate whether we're going to run a more carb heavy diet or a more high uh, fat diet. And I think to me that is the the better approach with, with someone or a client like this. Yeah, no, exactly. I do the exact same thing. And you know, with myself, it has it revolves a lot around gut health. I if my gut health is not that great, lower mm-hmm. carbohydrates tends to work better. Mm-hmm. But if my gut health is great higher carbohydrates get better performance i get better strength that's me personally right so i 100% how did you thing. know how did you know she was talking about gary tobbs it's in her it's on the notes it's oh her, i was yeah. like damn how did you, <laughs> yeah. you guys nailed that i'm like how did you know that yeah, yeah. I, didn't hear, I didn't hear her say it <laughs> you just read her mind <laughs> yeah well you know i have those special he's powers. the one on, that was on joe rogan and i know yes. lane norton came after him yeah, and lane so always like, goes after yeah him. lane likes to go after him hard but yeah. i mean some of the stuff he i've seen a lot of his stuff some of his stuff is he's he, an investigative journalist yeah. yeah that's what makes him yeah. so that's what makes that's why him people try so to tear apart. popular though yeah. is yeah. that there's truth in some of the stuff that he says um no the 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 investigative journalist Journalist I like is Max Lugavere because he really does a good job of looking at data, mm-hmm. breaking it down, looking at controls, and not being you know such an alarmist. And, and by the way, people love right. to just discredit somebody like that because they're not a you know they're they not didn't a, go through the conventional PhD program. Yeah, and I don't think that's fair at no, all no. because they they like a Max Lugavere. They could be more red than yeah. some of the nutritionists that are yeah. out it's there. It's just so there's studies that compare literally the same calories, low carb, high carb. What happens at the end? Very similar, very, very similar. Fat loss, health parameters, blood markers change. The individual variances are what determine, you know, which one's better or not. I mean, mm-hmm. if you have someone with like early stages of dementia, you know, a ketogenic diet might actually be good for them right. with, men- with cognition. Is that true for somebody without dementia? No, usually you don't see that much of a benefit or any benefit. So it, the individual variance is where things can get kind of weird. But when you look at generally speaking, um, no, it's not true that carbs uh, are the devil. 